We are so, so happy to be here and grateful. We are getting to um, just have amazing, amazing fellowship. Thank God the final four was here and there weren't any hotels. <laughs> so we got to stay with the Brittles and they had a huge fancy dinner party last night and one of us got to stay even in their Napoleon room. It was beautiful. There was all this Napoleon art, Napoleon plates. It was awesome and just got to meet so many of you. And what Lisa and Shelley and the whole staff here does is beautiful. And so I'm here not by myself. I always travel with the women from Magdalene and Thistle Farms. And today I am privileged to be traveling with Anika who runs the shipping department. If you were to call Thistle Farms and um, or just order online and have something shipped, she is the one that ships it. She has an amazing story that we won't really hear today. She um, was raised in Detroit in foster care and I think in seven homes was molested in all seven of them made her way, like most of the women in Magdalene and Thistle Farms, to drugs and streets pretty early. And um, she has been looking forward to coming here for months and saved tons of money from her work and I think spent it all at Macy's yesterday. <laughs> and so we are grateful that she's able to be employed on Sunday to um, start restocking her. <laughs> accounts and also with us is Jennifer and I've invited um, Jennifer they these are two of um, right at 50 employees at Thistle Farms in Magdalene who are all women who have survived trafficking prostitution and addiction and have come out of so much and share the journey of women who on average are first rate between the ages of 11 and 7 and 11 and who do hit the streets early and all but hope has been given up and she has hails from Ohio and is here to share a word of joy with you. Jennifer, come on. Good morning, everyone. It's been a real pleasure being in Dallas. I've had a wonderful time in Dallas, and thank you so much for having us. My name is Jennifer Klinger. I'm a 2012 Magdalene graduate. I'm a thistle farmer, and I'd like to welcome you to the circle to be loved lavishly. As a child, I was loved lavishly. For me, being loved lavishly is not so much material things. It's words of encouragement, hugs and kisses, a roof over my head, clothed and fed. My mother's love was next to none and always made me feel better. My father was stern and strict and his discipline was abusive and my uncle had an inappropriate touch. Not long after that, I was introduced to marijuana. As a result of these things, I became defiant and unruly. I ran away from home and became the target of pedophiles and human traffickers. I was fed drugs, told lies, had things done to me that I didn't even know was possible. My childhood was ripped away and I was traumatized. At the age of 17, I was married, had my first son James, and thought it was over and that from then on everything was going to be okay. I had pushed those tr prior traumas down so far that I was able to act as if they never happened. But they were there, and they still are. At the age of 19, I had a high-risk pregnancy. Upon delivering my son Kevin, the risk and the stress was too much for him, and he passed away. If there was anything kind and loving left in my life at that point, it at once stopped. My heart immediately went stone cold. I hardened my heart. It wasn't that my family stopped loving me, it was that I stopped loving me and I hated myself. I believe that we are born of love and meant for love. So when I started to reject that love 
an intense internal battle begun. I made a choice to leave the light and step into the dark. My mother held a memorial service for Kevin and I refused to attend. Once again, I was pushing down trauma and acting as if it never happened. I divorced my husband. I was frequently dropping my son off with my mother for days and sometimes even months at a time. It was then I started working in the sex industry. I did not have a waking moment when I did not need a chemical crutch. I used drugs to kill pain, grief, shame. The drugs increased into harder and harder drugs that ended up as an 18-year IV heroin addiction. The sex industry evolved from the so-called gentlemen's clubs to me walking the streets, jumping in strangers' cars, and I was basing it on my pain, greed, lust, and hate. In 2009, I was completely and utterly broken in Ohio. I felt that there was no love left in this world. Somewhere deep inside me, I knew my family still loved me, and I was pushing that down as well. One thing I've learned about drugs is that when I use drugs to kill pain, I am also killing my joy. It kills all feelings. Then one day, I had a moment of clarity. I told myself I can either stay stuck dying or get busy living. The love that I had been rejecting and pushing down had become a fire in my soul, and love came a calling. I did not have an ounce of fight left in me, so I surrendered to this love. I turned to God because he was my only choice and hoped that my life could be somewhat normal. That is when I found Magdalene in 2010. Upon walking through the doors with all my fears and doubts, several unknown women walked up to me, gave me a hug, and welcomed me home. I wasn't looking good, and I sure wasn't smelling good. <laughs> that is lavish love. They told me they believed in me and would help guide me to a better, more loving road. That is lavish love. They said they would pay for everything, from rent to laundry soap and everything in between. They told me they did not want anything distracting me from my healing process. That is lavish love. Yes, they gave me hugs and kisses, a roof over my head, clothes on my back, food in my belly, and I had not earned any of it. That is lavish love. Magdalene is a community of women who have survived lives of prostitution, trafficking, addiction, and life on the streets. It was founded in 1997 by Becca Stevens. It's two years and does not receive any state or federal funding. It depends on charitable contributions, a couple of grants, and the sales of our Thistle Farms products. There are about 50 women on our waiting list. There is a myth out there that says women like us don't recover, but we do, and I and my sisters are living proof that we do. Becca founded Thistle Farms in 2001 because the women of Magdalene were unable to find jobs due to criminal histories and lack of basic job skills. We make bath, body, and household products that are just as good for the earth as they are for the body. They are healing and are a great way to lavishly love our bodies. 100% of the profits goes to support the women in the communities. We hold monthly workshops, and our next one is tomorrow. And we have more than 65 people coming from 11 states. It is an opportunity for communities to come together to learn and share resources. There are several communities across this nation that are modeled after Magdalene, and several more that are in their first stages. I have returned to my family. I have brothers and a sister in the audience here, and we are loving each other lavishly. My heart and prayers go out to all the women on the streets in or in jail who have yet to feel what being loved lavish, lavishly feels like. Women who are just like me and Anika. It is my belief that love will always win if I just stop fighting it and surrender to it. Thank you very much for listening. And I'm turning this over to our wonderful founder, Becca Stevens. Thank you. I love you so much. I love you very much. Would you like to take over here? Yeah, let me just do that so that they can, I think it's for some kind of video recording. Okay. That was beautiful, Jennifer. So 
So when um, we knew we were coming here and we started looking at St. Michael's and what it was about, I just want to say some of the ministries and the way you approach it is all about lavish love. And I hope that what we're going to say just in the next few minutes is just a reminder about what the beautiful work is you're doing and the potential and the growth for how we can continue to lavish this love in our communities around us. Um, for me, the journey started 20 years ago, thinking about what it would be like to have a community that really was a witness to the truth that in the end, love is the most powerful force in the world. And I have longed to believe that my whole life. Stuart is right, my father was an Episcopal priest, but he was killed when I was um, five years old by a drunk driver. We had just moved to Nashville from New York with five kids, and um, my mom got stuck in Nashville with all these children. And it was community that really held us together and held us up, the church community. But it was also the place where I experienced sexual abuse. It was the place that was very, in some ways, healing and in some ways the worst that you can imagine, which is what happens in this world, is if kids get thrown into trauma and poverty that you're pretty good victims. And so learning about that and learning about how important it is for us to be a community, to be strong, and I think lavishness is a very strong way to love, to love without judgment, to love wholly is critical. So it led me to really start the Magdalene program and just say we're going to be a sanctuary. It's after the Benedictine model. Five women came in. I don't think anybody had less than 100 arrests. They had been in and out of the systems over and over and just say, let's just stop. Let's stop from being a part of the penal system, the religious system, the education system, even, you know, um, treatment systems in some ways and just be a community. And then farm all that out and try to make restitution and try to do programming and try to do education, but literally just love each other and have that as the foundation. So five women came in and it really changed my understanding of my own life and my faith and so we kept going. And then in 2001, we named this company Thistle Farms. And thistles were because that was the only flower growing. We would go find the women and go talk to women, and it'd be like this horrible underpass bridge or railroad tracks or just abandoned lots, and there'd be thistles growing. I mean, it can grow through concrete. It can push you know, all the way up through, um, what's it called, chain link fences. When we had the flood in Nashville, Tennessee, that was the big flower that survived. It was just like, bring it. And it's just, it's an amazing, amazing, noxious weed. <laughs> and we're all like it. We have these horribly prickly outer centers and reasons people should pay attention and back up a little bit. And we also all have these beautiful purple centers that even Solomon in all his glory is not arrayed like one of these. And so it became our symbol of how we are all, all of that, and how beautiful in the center of our lives are. So we started Thistle Farms, and we started thinking, now what the hell are we going to do with thistles? <laughs> and we did nothing. We did nothing for about seven or eight years. And finally, um, a few years ago, we decided we need to really start, because everybody's like, well, where is your Thistle Farm? And I'm like, we neither have farm nor thistle. <laughs> so we started harvesting thistles and we started making paper. We have now paper studio. We make all kinds of products from thistles and discarded flowers from altars. We grind it all up. We recycle t-shirts and mix them with thistle. And thistles are down, you know, the down of a thistle. And it ends up making these beautiful papers. So all of a sudden, we went from not using thistle and we had a shortage of thistle in January um, a couple years ago. And once, you know, the Tennessee Department of Transportation comes through, there are no more thistles left by the roadsides or anywhere come January. And so I found myself literally combing the streets of Nashville, you know, about almost 50 years old, looking for um, thistle and ended up out on a highway called Highway 100 on the outskirts of Nashville. And um, there was this huge field of half-dead thistle that somebody had missed. 
And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, this will make so much paper, help us so much, make the boxes we need, the journals we need. Pulled over on the side of the road, got out, and I started collecting it in a, you know, just a little grocery sack. And I realized um, a man was pulling up, and he slowed down, not in a scary way, but in a very concerned way. And all of a sudden, I saw myself through this man's eyes and how ridiculous I was that I had actually become a thistle farmer. <laughs> now, not just in the Episcopal Church, but in any profession, there's probably not a lower rung to reach than saying you're a thistle farmer, <laughs> the thing that people have spent their lives trying to get rid of. And I saw myself, um, you know, this middle-aged, woman just huddled like I was really excited over nothing and I started to weep. And I was crying, I think, because I was so grateful that all the mess ups I had had, all the trauma in my early youth, but also all the mercy people had shown me and all the gifts I had been given. What does that mean? We have to leave? We have to go? So the idea is that if we can get to a place, all of us, where we can see a half-dead field of thistle as a bounty, we are really grateful. Can you imagine how beautiful the world is if that is beautiful? And how it reminds us that there's nothing in creation that we need to abandon or discard as simply weeds. That all of it is part of some beauty and worthwhile and wonderful. And so thistles not only became a reality for us, but it also became a beautiful theology about discipleship and how we can be together. And thistles, one thistle can make another thousand. And if we believed that love was that strong and could do that much good and we had that much confidence in our faith that we could keep growing this and become a movement that was powerful, it was Wonderful. And so what's happened over the last couple years is that we have thistles from all over the world that come to us. People will be in Argentina and find a thistle and they'll pull out the down of it and save it and ship it. They'll be in Israel. They'll be in Rwanda. They'll be anywhere that they are and find thistle and bring it to us. And it's a reminder, too, of the universality. And the issues that we are dealing with are universal. The issues of... Um, sexual violence are universal issues that women do bear on their backs individually and how communities have to be a movement as powerful and as strong and tenacious as thistles to begin to heal that part. So every year we celebrate women who graduate and are part of it and we never try to waver from that and we also never try to not have a picture made without Thistle Farms products in them. <laughs> But all of these women are part of the Thistle Farms team, and they really are at the center of what we are about, and that's the nature of what lavishness is, that we never lose focus on that. And so where we are as a company, and what I want to talk about in lavishness for a minute is about the economics. Literally, it is good economics, that, some, that somehow what you didn't learn in business school or what you didn't learn in seminary, at least for me, is the idea that love is really good business, that you can invest a million dollars in one of our homes and it ends up being cheaper than prison, and that women can come and stay for free and it's still about half the cost of what it costs to incarcerate a woman for a year that you can start a company and hold your highest ideals and you can actually generate enough money to bring more and more women and start a movement. And what's happened for us, what we didn't know, so we're about 13 years into this program and these are the numbers in 2013 where we doubled our sales. That surely as love grows, it does grow in an ex exponential way. And you can think of it like concentric circles. So each bigger circle, it gets growing and growing. And we can't imagine what the potential is. But we feel like the more that we get to be with folks and to share this journey that, um, you know, we can do nothing but help more folks be a part of that. And the other thing about the lavishness of it, and this is the last slide on the economics of it, I promise is that um, for where we are in Nashville, Tennessee, we're just on 51st Avenue. That's where the manufacturing facility is. We have six houses around it where the women, not around it, but in the community that the women can stay for two years. 
but just the Thistle Farms part of it, we save the city because we don't take any federal or state money, over a half a million dollars a year just by being there. So it's not just about raising money and helping women. It is about lavishing and how love just keeps seeping out and giving to the whole community. None of this includes any of um, the figures that also would just add, probably turn this over to about three quarters of a million. Last year we had four women who were completely on disability, be off disability completely and have jobs. This doesn't add in all the children who were in child protective services that come back to their moms and that savings. This doesn't add in how paychecks are spent when they are in town and we had probably two or three women in the last couple months buy cars. I know we had two women last month who purchased homes in the Nashville community. None of those numbers are on there. But that this idea is that it's good for churches, it's good for communities, for us to be putting our best and our ideals. It's not that you just give your secondhand couches and give the minimum you have and see what happens. You kind of live into the ideals and put the best in it, make the best high quality products, make beautiful homes, do this in a beautiful way where people feel what it means to be loved by God so lavishly and so generously and so forgiving. So what's happened, this is one of the priests in San Francisco, Franny Kejnek, who has become a part of what we're doing. And what I want to say is that I have been overwhelmed most by, I mean, of all the stuff. Like what makes me weep is not the suffering anymore. I mean, I am undone by that, and the stories are horrific for sure. But what really makes me weep is getting to meet so many people in so many churches around the country who are not cynical, who are still hopeful, who still love, and who still want to be a part of it, and who haven't given up on a group of women that most people have for a long time. And the Episcopal Church has really taken the lead on it. We've had churches in New Orleans, in Arkansas, in St. Louis, in South Carolina, in New York. I mean, just over and over places where they're starting to get this idea that we can have sister organizations that are based on this beautiful Benedictine model that are healing. So last year we had our first national conference and what was so amazing about the national conference was not just that we had these fair trade markets where women's social enterprises from all over came together to help sell products and talk about best practices. The crazy thing was, so we have been doing this work forever, and it was the first time we ever had a national conference, invited people in, about 30 states came, um, wonderful group. It happened that Half the Sky, which is the PBS documentary, had filmed Thistle Farms in Magdalene about two weeks before. <coughs> And so the day we started the national conference was a Sunday, October 13th. And so Nicholas Kristoff and his whole team from Half the Sky and the New York Times had been down there. And on that Sunday morning was the first time we'd ever been featured in the New York Times as, you know, the op-ed piece of the day. And so it was everybody was at the national conference and it's like, please turn <laughs> to page four in the New York Times and <laughs> you'll see a little bit about what we are. So, what we're doing is we're hosting another one and we're inviting folks to come back together this October and we'll have another market and we'll have another chance for people to really network and be together and talk about what are best practices, what are the beautiful things that individual communities in Dallas or in Fort Worth or in Texas are doing and how can we keep encouraging each other to be about love and to be about um, just radically putting our faith into action. And when I say that, I really mean that. I mean with the idea of like, we will do our best, we will keep doing this, and what it does over and over again is feed back into our churches, our communities. It's a great model you know, for evangelism, for healing, for all those beautiful things. I mean, I am convinced that the church is about one sacrament, and that sacrament is healing. And baptism is part of that sacrament, and communion is part of that sacrament, and burials are part of that sacrament. So I really do believe that um, together we are all about healing. And so I'm just going to end it with one more story from the women of Thistle Farms. So while Anika does all the packing, I mean um, shipping, Doris does all the packing for the shipping. So her job is to literally um, 
just put everything in the different bins to go in different parties. We'll probably have something like seven or 800 events that she will pack this year. So she has a big job and she does it and she whistles literally while she works and she also composes songs. She has one song that she performed just at Emory a couple months ago that includes all, the lyrics include all 24 products we make. <laughs> so you can imagine what she's doing downstairs when she's packing. And um, she sang it for these, all these divinity school students at Emory at, at Candler and they gave her a standing ovation and she really hadn't been the same since. <laughs> Doris also witnessed um, the murder of her father when she was about eight years old, who um, was the beginning of her journey to the streets. And she s describes herself as um, living in so much fear that she walked a 10 block radius for 26 years in Nashville, Tennessee. A 10 block radius around and around and around for 26 years with no idea how to get out. And it wasn't because it was a great 10 blocks. It was a place where she robbed and was robbed, where she tricked and was raped. It was a place where she used and used other people and was abused and all of the things you can imagine was arrested and freed back and stayed there. Until a community who did believe in this idea that love is that lavish and powerful came to be with her. And so she came into Magdalene several years ago. She was on um, disability, has completely gotten off disability, lives on her own and she is one of the beautiful travelers around the country. In this past year, she went with me to Pensacola, Florida to the Episcopal Church women's group there who are starting to look in that area about having a sanctuary for women or survivors. And she got there and first of all, she had never flown before and um, on one of the previous trips and was laughing so hard when the plane took off, like a screaming kind of laughing. <laughs> that the attendant got on the microphone and said, on, on, on the loudspeaker system, and said, as soon as we're 10 feet, 10,000 feet up, it's a free drink for you. <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 that's a horrible idea. I, as her pastor, will drink that for her. <laughs> and we got to Pensacola. She had never, ever seen the beach. Just like, as you can imagine, so many of the women, they have seen underside of bridges, they have seen the short side of justice, they have seen the back side of anger, they have seen the inside of prison walls, and so many of them have never seen the sunrise from the shore. Or the beauty of just being in a whole new place with the landscape. So, I got to be with her um, the first morning when we got there and we got to walk out to the beach. And she, um, you know, when her feet hit the sands and she was just like joyful and she was like kind of unsteady going to the ocean. And when she very first stepped into the ocean, she was like, God did a great job. <laughs> and then the very next thing she said as she threw her arms up was, has this been doing this my whole life? Has this been doing this my whole life? All the time I was walking in a circle, was it doing this? And you think, my God, as long as the moon's been spinning around the earth, it's doing it. And love is as powerful and old as the tide for sure. But we need each other to remember the power of that and to be together and to remember the lavish nature of it that can heal us. She preaches it beautifully, and I swear to God, it is sometimes the most wonderful thing to see resurrection embodied in human form. And that's how lavish it is. It raises our spirits, it raises other spirits, and it continues to pour out until we all can't help but live in hope. Thank you guys so much. Please don't just buy products for yourself. Buy them for your friends, take them to your law offices, put them in your bathroom. They preach love heals on every single piece. Mother's Day is surely just coming around the corner, not a better present you can give for Easter, and we do not want to ship this stuff home. You guys can buy us out if we do this right. I even have bags, and I'll just put them over there, and you just fill the bags up, and then we'll just run them through the credit card machine really quick so we're not late for worship. Thank you, thank you, thank you.